one of the things I, I, I told you at the beginning of the semester uh, that as, as the semester would go, uh, the Facebook and Twitter world would be passing around, especially GeoGeeks would be passing around amongst them all these maps. And so the one that was been passed around this week is this one right here that shows the history of when residences in an area were built. And so the moral to the story here is the, pe the, the, the uh, tan, taupey, creamy uh, color are old, and then the purple are newer homes, uh, homes built in the 70s, 80s, 90s, whatever. And so why I show this is I think this is, you know, I'm trying to uh, kind of justify what I'm doing here to my own self, uh, but the order that we've gone in has definitely been chronological as well. And so we've gone to New England, a foundry, bread basket, I think there's definitely kind of a chronological path to what we got going on here. So where are we seeing growth, especially more recently? Definitely here in Dixie and uh, where we're going to go later on today, Mex America. And so where are jobs going to be available? They're not going to be as, as available as they were uh, historically in Cleveland, Detroit, New York. Uh, where we're going to find more jobs available are our Atlantas, our Charlottes, our Dallases, our Austin, Texas. Uh, and so these are places, this is why we're talking about them, because these are places that are going to be likely destinations for you uh, to actually find uh, jobs when you're uh, finished. Last place from the Upland Ridge, I'm just going to scoot through this one rather quickly. Uh, this is a, is, is a touristy area, uh, but um, an area that's seen uh, some good stories and some bad stories. Uh, but for the most part, things are actually on the up and up here. Uh, what I mean by that, things are doing are looking quite well here in the Upland South in terms of jobs, in terms of increasing ec uh, economic uh, growth, uh, but also increasing uh, uh, amount of income for individuals. And so we've talked about these last time. Now we're getting to our last area of the Upland South. In the Upland South, I'm going to further differentiate the differences between the Upland South and the Lowland South as we go through today. Uh, but of course, the duh, uh, the obvious is the fact that the upland is upland. Uh, and so it's going to be at a higher elevation, it's going to have those uh, characteristics going on. And so a key term, so throw out a key term, a good chance that this could be a fill-in-the-blank uh, response, is the meth belt. Uh, and so we'll go to, do you live near a meth lab? And so uh, all kinds of new maps out there, you can find out whether or not you live next to a child molester, uh, but you can also find out whether or not you live next to a meth lab. And if we go ahead and we look at where math labs are located, you're going to find them going to be located pretty much right here in this upland south, this Ozark, a Wichita region here of Arkansas, eastern Oklahoma, and southern Missouri. Uh, and the thing about this whole uh, where is meth located is the whole meth population, the whole meth users, the meth lab, it's migrating to us here in Indiana. And so one of the things is meth, it's really not that big of a problem in much of the Great Plains, uh, but it is definitely a problem here in this particular area of Arkansas. Uh, why do you think that's the case? Why, what, what is it about meth? And if you don't want to respond because you might know something you know, more than others, that's fine. It's cheap. So first off, you've got something that's cheap. And so why does that matter? Lower income individuals are going to afford it. Uh, and so something that's cheap, and so lower income individuals can't afford, uh, in this case, meth. Uh, I, I don't even know what the ingredients are, a lot of them, I, I, this is bad, I don't want this to have a discussion about the ingredients of meth here. Um, uh, what's that? Breaking Bad, you can just say you I've never seen it, so, oh, but Breaking Bad. So you've seen it, so you've all seen it, so I just can move on then. Uh, so you know all about meth, and so it's, it's cheap. <laughs> what else we got? It's highly addictive. Okay, so it's highly addictive, and so once you get it, uh, you can't get enough of it. Uh, and so that's one of the things about this drug is it's 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 one of the, it's, it's a lot a lot like other drugs in which once you have it, you want more of it uh, because the the I'm assuming the buzz feels good. Um, what else we got going on? It's not hard to make a, like a low quality of it. I don't think. Hmm. Like there's that's probably a more like low low educated area of the country, so it's easier for them to make that than it would be to do to do other things. Bada bing, bada boom. And so you have an out tight in education levels. And so you have low income, low education, it's cheap. Um, another key thing is accessibility. Uh, and so accessibility, you could also throw in rural, ruralness. Rurality, I think is the proper term there, and then ruralness. Um, but it's another thing, it's a white thing. 
don't see a large amount of African Americans doing meth. Now I don't know the reasons why. I could go. I could have uh, got up an hour earlier and found out the reasons why, but I chose not to. Um, but but we can see it's it's definitely in an area that we see a large white, rural, low income, low education population. Uh, so essentially, you got a lot of depressed people, a lot of people that are down and out, out on out of the joke. Things haven't been good. Uh, especially younger people. Those are also meth users, younger people. Uh, so you kind of have these various ingredients uh, that are the reasons why meth is popular in this particular area. You go back, oh, 50, 60 years ago, we could pretty much say moonshine uh, was the, uh, the same thing, but over here in southern Appalachia. Low income, easy to make, low education, remote, uh, young people, yada, yada, yada. Uh, so we can kind of understand why this particular area has this negative of having high prevalence of meth busts, meth labs, meth users, all of that good stuff, or bad stuff. Alright, so there's the meth labs. We now know where people drink, and we now know where people do meth. Uh, probably the next one, Ecotopia, we'll find out a lot about marijuana. Uh, meth methamphetamines as far as roots, another key thing as far as why this particular area is there's many different routes that come right through it, so it's very accessible to get. And so if the meth isn't coming through you, if the meth isn't coming near you, then of course you're not going to have access to it. Uh, and so you have both a southern migration, but also a west to east migration as far as the meth production getting to more desirable places uh, further to the east where it is in uh, demand. Anyway, uh, and so we go back to broilers. What are broilers? Chickens. Chickens. Uh, so now we're looking at the growth in the, the I'm sorry, not the growth, but the, uh, uh, the agricultural uh, characteristics of, of this particular area. And one thing is they've got a lot of chickens. Uh, and so here's where we find a lot of corporate farms, corporate chickens. And so that chicken in a bag uh, that you're going to eat later tonight from Tyson's, uh, that's a good chance it's from right here in this particular area, Arkansas, or it could be over here in the, uh, uh, this area that we're going to talk about a little bit later on. Uh, and so here we see uh, the, uh, the growth of the chicken industry. And so the chicken industry is actually something in the last 20 to 30 years that has taken off here. And so while we have this disparity, we've got the poor, uh, we've got the negatives, uh, all the stuff we've been talking about, there's been a recent growth in the economy due to commercial agriculture, particularly uh, chickens. Uh, and so if you don't believe me, uh, Tyson, Tyson Chicken, uh, its origins, its headquarters, its guy that's named after Mr. Tyson, uh, not Mike, uh, Mike uh, was from Arkansas. And so Arkansas is essentially the headquarters of Tyson Chicken. And so now as this is becoming a more globally consumed item, we're not the only ones eating Tyson Chicken. All throughout the world they're eating Tyson frozen chicken. And so as this becomes more in demand, no wonder that those particular places are continuing to grow. And so this is one area in which the agricultural industry, or would say, I don't know, livestock, whatever, is actually growing because of, uh, of, of uh, corporate farming, corporate uh, ag, which has its good things, its bad things. You know, this is the whole thing. I think they've done studies or, or videos of, of chickens without heads and all that. I don't know. I don't watch any of that stuff. It freaks me out. But I like the taste of the chicken. Uh, so that's all I care about. Um, next up. Uh, so we've got two positive stories coming out of, of this rather depressed area that yeah, the last 100, 120 years hasn't been too good for Arkansas uh, in this whole area. Uh, and so the second thing is the Walmart effect. And so we've got two things that have been, uh, two businesses uh, that have really been driving the economy here. Uh, and so we've got Tyson and like I said, it's suppliers and all of those corporate uh, farms. Uh, all the corporate chicken farms that have been popping up now to, uh, because of the demand of Tyson chicken. But the other one, the big one, Walmart. Uh, so Walmart's something at 40 years, I don't even know if it was around 40 years ago, but if it was, it was just a small little local chain here in the middle of nowhere, northern Arkansas. Uh, so Walmart has had a stimulating effect here in this particular area. Once again, I started this by showing the whole meth lab, or the whole meth belt, to show this area as being not what we think of as an area of economic progress, but it's happening right now. And so what's going on here? First off, the headquarters of Walmart is in Bentonville, Arkansas. Uh, so Bentonville, Arkansas is up there in the northern part of the state. Um, one of the things is since Walmart has taken off, since Walmart is found in pretty much every single town, 
and found in, in some cases, multiple places in uh, uh, individual towns. It's since grown, and so now you've got more management level jobs. Now you've got people doing logistics. Now you've got, do, you've got people doing marketing and sales, uh, global sales. And so you're adding a diversified workforce to the Arkansas population. A population that previously low education, low skill, not much change, out migration. Now we're seeing a place that's actually growing. And it's gaining with high skilled, high, highly educated individuals. People from California are moving to Arkansas. People from India are moving to Arkansas. Why? Because they want to work for a company that they know is going to pay them well, but also a company that's definitely poised for continued growth. And so you're seeing a growth of all the suppliers, but then you've got those tertiary sector jobs. And once again, it's a good thing when you've got a variety of job sets, primary, secondary, tertiary, because all of your eggs aren't in one particular basket. And so I've talked throughout the semester about the brain drain, especially in places like New England, the foundry, and the breadbasket. Now we're seeing a brain gain in which uh, highly skilled individuals are moving to an area that's changing the characteristics of it. Uh, so we've got higher skilled individuals. A lot of IUP, uh, IUPUI graduates would be primed for jobs working in middle of nowhere Arkansas. And I can take us to Arkansas. Uh, what's I won't take you to Arkansas, uh, but one of the things you'll note is Bentonville, Arkansas now has a major international airport. And so now you have an international airport in this particular area. Once again, I think emphasizing uh, the growth here. All right, I, mean, I am going to take you to, to Branson because we've got the tourism. All right, now we've got to go to this godforsaken place, Branson. Uh, so Branson, Missouri. There we go. All right, Branson. First up, what do we notice? Rivers. What about them? They're squiggly. They're squiggly. Coming off of what we talked about at the end last time. Dammed up. Dammed up rivers. And so throughout this area, uh, there are no really natural lakes. And so anytime you've got a natural lake, uh, it's, it's very, 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 very rare. And so anytime you have these types of lakes, all it is a dammed up river. And we showed that last time with uh, Lake Monroe, uh, is a dammed up river. Uh, so all throughout this entire area, we're going to look at more dammed up rivers uh, later on. Uh, but the whole dammed up rivers, what that does is it takes an area, it has this river, has, it doesn't have much going on there, and now it turns, it kind of draws in people there. People like boating. People like uh, big old wide open water. Uh, uh, areas. And so now you've got people in condos all lined up here, lake houses and all of that. And so that then, uh, the damming of this particular river, then spurred development here in Branson. Uh, so that's now more and more people recreating out here in the middle of nowhere, Missouri, going to this lake. Uh, it then has this touristy uh, little city start to develop. And it develops here in Branson. Uh, if you've ever been, anybody been to Branson? Tell me about Branson. Like a lot of like musical, like theater type things. Yeah, did you enjoy it? I mean, kind of cool. Yeah, uh, so it's kind of got chic. And so here's the main street of Branson. It's kind of got this whole country. Uh, it caters, I think, a little bit to an older audience. I think it caters more to uh, grandma and grandpa. Uh, but Branson here has become a touristy area, more for this particular area of the country. Uh, so Branson. Uh, in the middle of nowhere here, Missouri, uh, right there on a dammed up river, which then brought people there uh, to, to create um, uh, brands. And let's see, Benville is that anywhere? They have, like they have showboats there, right? Showboats, uh, probably. Yeah, because it's all about make, giving these people the, the you know people this feel that they're in an old time place when it's not authentic at all. Uh, you know, rivers, showboats, or whatever, uh, uh, showboats, whatever they are, what, what, showboats, rowboats, whatever. Uh, you know, they, they are not native there. Uh, it's not like there's, you know, they have a whole history of it, but touristy people like that. Um, there we are, Bentonville. Northeast Arkansas. There's Bentonville. Middle of nowhere, Arkansas, and boom. Uh, they've got an airport here. Uh, and so, you know, one way I can showcase the growth, once it focuses, 
Come on now, boy. Take you back to Arkansas. All right, here we go. Come on. This is boom. Newly constructed high, uh, a runway. So it shows you the growth. I mean, they're adding runways uh, to the International Airport here in Bentonville, Arkansas. Uh, I think that kind of emphasizes, once again, uh, this whole idea. All right, back to the uh, lecture at hand. Uh, so going back to the whole upland and lowland south. All right, so here's the question. And once again, I'll start adding more. I'll start adding these to the, uh, uh, the Encore site uh, so we don't have to feverishly write these down. Uh, but describe three key differences between the upland and the lowland south. And so once again, this is a potential written response question. And so this would be included in the, mid or the final exam review as a particular possible uh, written response question. But once again, if you can answer this question, you know, it might not be a written response. It might be a multiple choice question. But nonetheless, if you can at least answer it as a written response, uh, it's a good study tool uh, to use for the exam. Uh, so describe three key differences between the upland and lowland south. Other than the whole upland lowland thing, let's go ahead and try to figure that out. So now we're going to move on to the lowland south. And so here's the image I, I, I yanked uh, from the uh, group last time. Uh, and so we can kind of see it, we can kind of visualize it. What do we notice as far as the upland versus the lowland in terms of age? Upland older. Upland older, lowland younger. And so that we just realized that. That was, that was just popped out of nowhere. Uh, so. Uh, the upland is a uh, older population, the lowland is a younger population. So that's our first one. Uh, and so why is that the case? We've got a lot of different factors going on. So that's what we're going to explain today. Uh, it's trying to understand, okay, why is it so much younger here? And just a quick, quick 411, just so you can go ahead and write down while it's fresh on the brain, migration. Uh, migration, so we're going to look at a forced and mass migration, explains why this area is still young to this day, or has a younger population. Uh, but then more recently, uh, a Latino or an in-migration uh, that uh, uh, has also uh, been causing this area to be young. All this I'm going to explain uh, as we go on today. So the lowland south. As we're going to go through today, we're going to start over here uh, in the Virginia Carolinas. We're going to sweep across Georgia, uh, Alabama, and Mississippi, uh, then get to Texas. Uh, so Texas is part of Mex American, so it's a nice, simple way we can then flow into the next group. Uh, so we'll flow into the next grouping, uh, the next region, just by skirting east to west across the southern part of the country. And so we've got a term here, uh, the Piedmont. Uh, and so the southeastern Piedmont and coastal plain. Uh, and so within the lowland south, there's three individual regions. We're really going to only hit us. We're going to hit only. Hit, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're only going to hit two of them. Uh, and so the Florida part, we're going to come back and talk about when we come back and talk about the islands. Because uh, the Florida part has a lot of characteristics that do blend itself nice with the islands. And also the islands is a kind of small region, so it gives me more to talk about. Uh, we can interject Florida in there. Uh, and so we go, once again, go to, we start off with our physical geography. Uh, when we look at the, uh, uh, the uh, coastal plain uh, and the uh, Appalachians, the, the area right now that I'm referring to is the southeastern Piedmont. Uh, slash coastal plain is just all of this on this side of the Appalachian Mountains. And so we've already talked about the Appalachian Mountains. And this is all going to be to the eastern side from uh, essentially the, the summits, the, 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 the Appalachian Mountains, all the way till we get to the beaches and the shorelines of uh, the east coast. So we got a definition, a key term, and that's Piedmont. Uh, and so Piedmont is the reference to, it's the name for this particular area of the country. It's referred to as the Piedmont uh, region. What does Piedmont mean? It just means foot of the mountains. Uh, and so the foot of the mountains. And so essentially the Piedmont is going to be our area here that's very steep. And then the coastal plain is where we're going to be leveling out. Once again, what's going to be right here? The fall line. So the fall line, you know, the fall line before this class was something I just kind of looked at very much glancing. Oh, that's cool. That's a neat little thing. Now that I've prepared more and more for these lectures, I found out how critical it is to understand why cities are located where they are. And so the fall line is essentially that elbow between the steeper Piedmont and then the uh, very, very flat, gentle sloping coastal plain. And so subsequently, we got a whole different characteristic uh, as far as what we would find in these particular areas. 
And so here's a, another way we can visualize this. This is a terrain map. And so you can see the, uh, uh, the higher elevated areas are going to be yellowish or brown, and the lower uh, elevated areas are going to be this greenish color. And so we've essentially we can just very, much, very quickly understand this. We've got our Appalachian Mountains, we've got our coastal plain, we've got the fall line right in the middle, boom, there's the Piedmont. So the Piedmont is that between the Appalachian Mountains and the fall line. Uh, we find the Piedmont. Uh, so the Piedmont, there's really not much we can talk about. It. There's really not much going on there. It's been lightly populated throughout much of its time as far as humans being, uh, sorry, uh, uh, as far as Europeans being in this particular area. Uh, but it does have something we can connect with um, in terms of moonshine. Uh, so we'll come back to that here in just a second. Uh, but then we've got the coastal plain. When you get along the edge, uh, when you get on the edge, you get this very much this marshy, swampy area. Uh, and so I mean, when you get to the edge, you get to the, to the marsh and swamp areas. Uh, if you're further south, obviously that's where we're going to find our gators. Uh, but, um, and so we can kind of try to visualize this, I guess. And so swampy waters. Uh, for swampy uh, areas, uh, marshy areas, it needs to be extremely flat. Uh, it needs to be extremely flat, but also uh, marshy areas aren't there right on the shoreline. Uh, so uh, these are very much these areas that have uh, not a lot of waves, very, very slow moving uh, and flat, slow moving water and very, very, very flat surfaces. And so we're going to find marshy, swampy areas there. We're never going to find them further up uh, because that water doesn't stay there. Uh, so these super flat areas is where we find marshlands, marshy areas, swampy areas uh, along the coastline. We'll come back to that idea a little bit further. Another way to visualize this, and so this is more just to get this on video, so if you want to study for this a little bit later on, you can see it. Uh, this is what uh, someone took uh, uh, Virginia, uh, took the state of Virginia and kind of dissected Coastal Plain, Piedmont, uh, then the Appalachians and all of that, uh, for kind of the side view, uh, for those that are really geeked out about this. All right, uh, and so now we've got kind of, we'll work our way to some urban geography, and so try to understand why we see this cluster of population right here. Uh, and so why do we think the cluster population is there? Uh, once again, our good friend, the fall line, pops up. Uh, and so this cluster population we still see to this day uh, are those fall line cities that uh, happen to be right there in between Piedmont and Coastal Plain. All right, let's talk now about bootlegging. All right, so last time I talked about moonshine. Who wants to talk about moonshine for me? Who wants to re-explain moonshine? Oh, I have the equation. I'll give you the equation. Uh, so the, with the, go ahead and run off the equation. It's uh, depressed people and low authority equals moonshine. Okay, we can go. You are now my enemy. I'm just saying. Oh, and water and lots of water. Okay, so we can go back to the meth area. Uh, so say that whole formula again. It's lots of water. Okay, other than water. Uh, depressed people. Depressed people. And low authority. Low, low authority. Remoteness. Corn. Yeah, we don't have it's um, corn. We don't need corn for meth. But those are two key things that we can also trace back and understand moonshine's history back here. All right, so let's go look and try to find out more about our moonshine. Uh, where, do, where, where do we find moonshine? In the mountains. Up in the mountains. So let's go to the mountains. I've been to the mountains. I love moonshine. Do you like moonshine? Yes, I like great moonshine. Grape? No, apple pie. You say grape? Yeah, grape and peach okay. pie. No. All right, so here's the mountains. And so up here is where our moonshine was grown, or, or grown, uh, where it was made. And we talked about the reasons why last time. But you have this moonshine. You make a bunch of it. You need money. I mean, it's cool and all to sit there and drink with your buddies and make it. Uh, but unless you're making some money from it, what's the point? Uh, and so there became a desire to then sell this moonshine through more markets. And so here you have something that's in demand, alcohol, during a time which alcohol was not allowed. Uh, and so that's why it was something that was very highly demanded, uh, because people love to have a good buzz. Uh, and then we have this other problem as far as, well, if you're in these populated areas of the fall line, how do you get that booze? How do you get that moonshine? And so then we had a second industry kind of come off of moonshine, and that's bootlegging. That's getting moon, that's actually driving the moonshine from the mountains, from the source areas, to the population that, that wants it. Uh, and so that population that wants it is going to be in various places all throughout the fall line. 
Uh, and so the fall line, we can simply follow the fall line. Uh, it's on I-95. Uh, and so Winston-Salem, Greensboro, Danville, Lynchburg, Roanoke. Uh, these are all places, Charlotte, uh, all places that now suddenly had a source area for that thing that they wanted, booze, moonshine. Uh, so then uh, you had to have the transportation from there to there. Who did that? That's our bootleggers. Uh, and so what they would do is they would have to soup up their cars. What does that mean? Uh, adding really, really nice suspensions. Adding a little extra spring so that they can then haul that extra weight in their car. Uh, also, better engines, faster engines. Why do they want fast engines? Why do they want uh, great suspensions? Why do they want the best tires? Why do they want best cars? Because you got to outrun the cops. Because you got to outrun the cops. And so this whole idea of bootlegging, outrunning the cops, they call them the revenuers, that's the cops, uh, is bootlegging. And so then you started having these guys tinkering on old cars, you know, and making them all sophisticated and all of this. Um, just like anything men do, uh, they like to suddenly compare with other men. Uh, women do it too, I guess. Uh, the men, they like to compare with other men, and so they all have this kind of this machismo. My car is faster than you. I'm a better mechanic than you. I'm a better engine builder than you. I'm a better driver than you. And so then we have the origins of NASCAR. And so the origins of NASCAR actually date to these individuals who are just essentially wanting to compete, see who had the fastest one on obviously non-driving days, on non-bootlegging days, and they would race each other. And so essentially the early races of NASCAR were bootlegging cars in which they just smack a number on it and then go race. Uh, so those early cars that were actually today, what is NASCAR, the corporate cars that have all those logos all over it, originally were bootleg cars that were just trying to haul whiskey uh, from one place to the next. And so we can go to one place in particular to see, oh, do, 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 where is it? And that's North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. Uh, so North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. Um, uh, for, for those of you who've read my master's thesis, you know all about North Wilkesboro. Uh, but there it is, North Wilkesboro Speedway. A small little track that originally was a dirt track way out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and it was in this farm field in which you had these bootleggers who essentially just kind of came together, had this unorganized race. All of a sudden people wanted to check it out. Boom, you've got, your, you got a, new th a new thing now. Uh, and so over time, uh, people were attracted to this particular area. NASCAR no longer races there, and so my thesis looked at the impact of NASCAR no longer racing there. Uh, but anyway, uh, and so that's North Wilkesboro, North Carolina, uh, and relates to moonshine. Back to the lecture at hand. Now let's go to the tidewater. All right, so what does tidewater mean? Uh, tidewater is this particular area of coastal Virginia. So now we're looking at the coastal plain of Virginia. Uh, the coastal plain of Virginia we find what is called the Tidewater. Why is it called the Tidewater? It's called the Tidewater because we have several rivers that penetrate inland, and these rivers are actually affected by the tides. And so if you go out to the White River here, and go out and stare at it, you're not going to see it rise throughout the day. It's not influenced by tides, high tide, low tide which we associate with the coast. We all know high tide, low tide from our visits to the beach. Uh, and so this is a situation where you have inland rivers that actually have fluctuations up and down of, uh, of the, the, this, the, the level, the water level, uh, throughout the day and throughout the, the month, the year, uh, due to the tides. Uh, and so this penetrates as far deep as Richmond, Virginia. Uh, and so Richmond, Virginia, as we'll see here in a minute, is pretty far inland. But it actually has a river, and then subsequently, as a various physical uh, uh, environment, <clears throat> uh, has these various features uh, that are then uh, created from that. I'll just take you there. I'll just take you right now to the tidewater, just to show you what I mean. <clears throat> so the tidewater. Uh, so the tidewater, we're looking at, oh, let's go ahead and look at normal view. There's our north. Uh, so Virginia Beach. Uh, for those of you who've been to Virginia Beach, boom, it's right there. Uh, so here, the James River. It goes all the way here. There's a good friend, Richmond, a fall line city. And if you go right there, you'll actually see the river go up and down throughout the day. And so all these various areas, all throughout here, are referred to as the tidewater. Uh, and so the tidewater is essentially this inland coastal area that has fluctuations over time. And so one, one of the things we're going to find out is uh, particular agricultural crops 
kind of like this whole situation of water coming in and water coming out. Um, so we're going to come back to that whole idea. That's the reason why we're talking about it now. Uh, and so a particular crop uh, grew very, very uh, well here uh, way back when, which helps explain settlement. All right, back to the lecture at hand. See how many times I can say that today. All right, uh, drowned rivers and estuaries. And so now we go back to our good friends, the drowned rivers and estuaries. And so the same things, it makes sense, we're not too far away from the Chesapeake Bay, the same things are created there. And so what I do is I've recently come across this website, uh, Surging Seas, Sea Level Rise Analysis by Climate Central. And I find this, you know, it's cool, okay, it's great, we're going to be able to see uh, you know, if sea level rises over time because of global warming, we're going to see which areas would be affected by it. That's cool and all. I'm going to instead take that and use it to showcase this whole drowned rivers and estuaries thing. And so over time, I'm going to raise the sea level 10 feet. Uh, 10 feet. I'm going to raise it 10 feet. And so one of the things you're going to notice is now we're going to have more and more areas that are underwater. And so that explains how a river over time gets bigger and bigger and bigger as sea level rise. Uh, and so the whole Chesapeake Bay. Chesapeake Bay used to be a small little river that over time has gotten bigger as the sea level has risen and then gone up and penetrated further inland. Three feet, four feet, five. So we'll go back in time. And so we can see how these little inlets get bigger and bigger and bigger over time. And so I'm just taking this and using this as a way to visualize the whole drowned rivers and subsequently uh, estuaries thing. All right. Now we've got another physical feature. In fact, my fav favorite physical feature uh, that we have anywhere in the world. Second favorite, sorry. Uh, my second favorite. Uh, and that's our good friends, the Barrier Islands. <clears throat> and I know if you like beaches, here you go. Uh, we get to talk about beaches now. Alright, so here we're going to uh, look at barrier islands, try to understand how and why they form. Uh, barrier islands, let me go ahead and zoom out so we know what we're looking at. <clears throat> uh, here is coastal North Carolina. So now all we're doing is moving a little bit further south from tidewater. Here you've got this long, thin line here. That long, thin line, we zoom in, we can see that long, thin line goes all the way around. We'll get rid of the roads. So we, because I know you're saying, well, what's the road, Andy? <laughs> Barrier Island, boom, 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 all the way down. Coastal Carolinas, boom, more of them. Uh, Charleston, Barrier Islands, Barrier Islands, all the way down through here. Man, these suckers continue to go all the way down. Jacksonville, now we're down to Jacksonville. Now we got some carnies and meth heads. <laughs> there they are. Say hi. Barrier Islands, Barrier Islands, Barrier Islands. Uh, just, for, uh, just for amusement purposes, we'll go to the other coast. We'll go over here to Florida, Panama City, all that. Destin, more Barrier Islands, Barrier Islands, Barrier Islands. So essentially, the entire Gulf Coast and much of the Atlantic Southeast Coast is bordered by Barrier Islands. Now these barrier islands you know very well as beaches. And so for instance, if you go to Daytona, you've got Daytona, and then you've got that little intercoastal waterway that you go over, and then you've got Daytona Beach. And that's the case for most of the beaches we find out there. Most of the towns have their city, uh, and so let's think of this Florida, uh, then we've got kind of that intercoastal, then we've got our barrier island. So for instance, Daytona's here, the track's over here, uh, then Daytona Beach is separate. Uh, where else are we going to go? Where else do we see this happen? Myrtle Beach, same deal, right? Myrtle Beach, they've got that little intercoastal waterway. Start rattling off more beaches. Gulf Shores is the same way. Gulf Shores, same deal. you got the little intercoastal waterway, then you get to Gulf Shores. Um, uh, South Padre, South Padre, you got the little intercoastal waterway that you have to go across. So you got Brownsville, map quiz place, Brownsville, and then across, uh, you've got South, uh, South Padre Island, and that's another example of a barrier island. Been to Galveston, Galveston, Texas. Another example of a barrier island. Been to um, the, uh, the Outer Banks. Have you? Nope. Oh, same deal. Uh, another example of a barrier island. All right, let's figure out how and why these suckers form. All right, I need a, an eraser. All right, so don't get one. <laughs> going back here. It's useful. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's do. Let's kind of go back in time. 
to our good friends, the Appalachian Mountains. And so let's try to figure out over here uh, these um, uh, coastal ones over North Carolina. All right, so we've got our good friends, the Appalachian Mountains. And so our Appalachian Mountains right there. Uh, pretty much all the rivers coming off of the Appalachian Mountains through the Piedmont, through the coastal plain, all are going this way. All just go straight to uh, the Atlantic. Uh, so they go straight pretty much in a southeast direction. Uh, and so if you're looking at this, you're probably thinking, the Appalachian Mountains don't look like that anymore, Andy. You're right, they don't. Uh, they now look like little round hills, don't they? I mean, to us, compared to Indiana, yeah, they're big old suckers. Uh, but compared to the Rockies, uh, they're nothing like that. But once, once again, way back when, they used to be just as big as the Rockies are today. Uh, and so we have all this sediment there, right? Uh, and so all this sediment that's no longer there. Uh, it's not like all of a sudden it's like, like magic dust which just disappears. It's got to go somewhere. And so over time, those rivers that I talked about have then taken that sediment and taken it and dumped it off at the coastline. Uh, and so essentially what was once uh, the Appalachian Mountains has been removed, carried by rivers, and then dumped out into the oceans. And we're going to really see this when we look at the Mississippi River Delta. Uh, when we look at uh, 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 Louisiana, uh, we're going to really see that actually that sediment being spilled and dumped out into uh, the, uh, the ocean. Okay, so that's half the story. Uh, and so we've got essentially this sediment that's been removed from the Appalachian Mountains and everywhere interior that's been bringing that sediment to the coastline. If we notice though, these suckers kind of look like Hershey Kisses, right? Uh, we notice that the barrier islands very, very long and thin, correct? We all notice that, right? Maybe. Uh, so when we go to the ocean, uh, do the waves come at you or the waves go away from you? They do both. I know, but what do they do for the most part? They come at you. They come at you. Uh, so for the most part, you notice this, the waves come right at you. And so coming out the other way, you have a counteracting influence that helps to shape that sediment. And so then, I don't know if this is in the way, so then we up, what we've got going on is this very thin line. And these are those barrier islands. And so, you know, if you're a future uh, a tourism agency, as far as, you know, promoting, uh, uh, you can just knock their socks off with your knowledge of barrier islands and tell them they'll probably be going to a barrier island. Now, the thing about these barrier islands, um, they are you know, obviously become the number one tourist-driven places. They've become heavily developed uh, and all that stuff. And it makes sense. Uh, these are places in which you can see this, you know, see the sunrise, and there's the beach right there, and the beach is really long and straight. You can see it for a while. You can go on a nice long walk. All that good stuff. The problem with this, of all the things in nature, of all the kind of the physical landforms that we actually kind of sit and stand on, these are probably one of the most fragile. Uh, these are the ones that have been formed the most recent, but also the ones that are most susceptible to change. And so if you get a hurricane coming through here, essentially these little teeny little barriers are just going to be wiped right out, which we've seen already. Uh, and so while they kind of have this blessing and the curse, they're beautiful, uh, they've got great location, and they're sites of all this development, but guess what happens when a hurricane comes through? All that development's going to be all for naught as essentially the island is no longer. And so these are also places that are very susceptible to uh, sea level rise. Uh, so sea level rise, these places will be gone. Uh, so we'll have um, uh, these, these various tourist destinations. We're one of the last groups to probably enjoy Daytona, Myrtle Beach, all those various places. All right, where are we going to go next? Oh, um, yeah, go for it. So for the sediments, how sturdy are they? Um, they're fairly sturdy. I mean, they're, uh, it's over time, over, you know, a lot of, it's mostly sand. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's uh, a lot of sand that's over time. But yeah, it's over time compacted, uh, and it compacts pretty well. Uh, but we've gotten especially very good at building buildings in those types of, uh, those, those very low desirable uh, bedrock and underlying rock areas. Because I, I'm from a city that's built basically on top of a sand bed in lower Indiana, and when we have, whenever we do have earthquakes, which don't happen, happen very recently, there's lots of cracks that you find throughout the city just because of poor plant planning in an old city. So. Yeah, uh, exactly. And so that's, I mean, getting insurance in these places is nearly impossible. Nearly impossible. Um, yeah. Um, a question about the tidewaters. Yeah. How do people get fresh water there? Because it seems like it would be it's a, it's, problematic. It's, a, it's, a, it's what they call brackish water, and so it's a mix. 
Uh, and so it's a mix between salty and fresh water. So there's somewhere there's actually the line where it then changes to predominantly fresh water. But there is that transition zone, we call that brackish water. Uh, and so, you know, you know, where does that start? What do they do with it? I don't know particularly, because obviously they're going to have to use some desalinization if they're going to use it for uh, any of that. But I uh, um, don't know. Did I, did I, was that your question? Pretty much. Cool. I'm just, I, did I interrupt? No, I no, probably just did. I've <laughs> been interrupting all day. Anyway. I get excited. Now let's talk about ag. Um, we've got two more weeks, right? Two more weeks? Right on. Really? Yeah, I think so. As far as lectures. Uh, we've got Ecotopia next week, and then we've got uh, the Islands and uh, Empty Quarters, uh, a combined duo the following week. All right, moving right along. Uh, agriculture. And so now another way we can differentiate between Upland South and Lowland South. So now let's talk about different types of agricultural practices. Uh, and so we've got two different types. Uh, we've got the yeoman farmer and the plantation. Uh, and so the yeoman and the plantation. Uh, the yeoman, that's going to be upland south. Plantation, that's lowland south. The yeoman farmer. The yeoman farmer uh, is, go ahead and I'll just describe them. Um, white, <laughs> small farm, small land holding, land holding, so small farm, small amount of land, not big farm, um, subsistence farmer, what that means is uh, they're growing ag for themselves not growing ag to sell. And you can also go in, because they're for themselves, it's a diverse array of stuff. Uh, so they're growing a, very, a variety of things. Some corn, some tobacco, some soybeans. So they grow a variety of things. All right, so yeoman farmer. Uh, yeoman farmer, small, White, um, small farm, small land, grows for themselves, very much private, very much to themselves. Um, also, don't require a lot of labor. That makes sense. They're small. They don't require a lot of labor either. That's characteristic of the upland south. The lowland south has characteristics that are different. In plantation, uh, style agriculture. Plantation, kind of going to be the opposite of all of this, uh, of yeoman. Uh, plantation, big, massive, huge land holding. Massive amount of acreage. Typically just one crop though. Typically just one thing. Cotton, rice, sugar cane. Uh, so pretty much there's that one thing in which this massive property in which it's owned uh, by an individual who isn't the one that's doing the farming. The farming is done by labor, and so a massive amount of labor. So this is the inverse of these. So one, small, the other one's big, requires lots of labor. One thing, and overwhelmingly, it's all geared to profit. It's all geared to make some cash. Not so much about putting food on the family's plate for that family dinner, more about making some cash. All right, we differentiate between the two. Yeoman, small, white, upland, plantation, big, huge, massive amount of area, one single crop, and that crop we're trying to make some money, we're trying to make some money off that crop. All right, so we got through that. So several key trends and geographic patterns in the Dixie today. We could pretty much carry on what I just said. So yeoman versus plantation, that's still the case. And so one thing that you can say is we still have this legacy of small farms versus big farms. 
farms that are diverse as far as the crops. They're typically for individuals versus ones that are for one, you know, one crop for, uh, for wide global consumption. All right. So this helps explain why um, we're going to find a lot more agricultural output, a lot more ag being done in the lowland south. Because it's very much a business. Uh, you know, the lowland south, agriculture is a dominant economy. Uh, not so much anymore, it's changed. But historically, it is number one. And it's a key to understanding why uh, a question I'm definitely going to ask on the uh, final exam uh, that I'm going to ask a little bit later on. It's key to understand why the South really isn't, it hasn't really urbanized until recently. It's because it has this long history of, uh, the, especially the Lowland South, of being agricultural uh, focused, uh, not really focused on industry, manufacturing, anything like that. Anyway, all right, so let's go through and try to look at some trends. And so some trends uh, regarding uh, agriculture in uh, the South. First off, tobacco. Uh, now, last time I talked about tobacco, I showed a map of Kentucky. Uh, the tobacco that Kentucky grows, a lot of times, for what you put in your mouth. There's in your lip there. That's more the tobacco that you found from Kentucky. The tobacco that you smoke, uh, the tobacco that you smoke in your cigarettes, comes from this particular area. So, coastal plains, uh, there in North Carolina, uh, is where you find a large tobacco industry, and it makes sense where the headquarters of your tobacco companies are located. Uh, for instance, R.J. Reynolds, right here, right smack dab. Where's R.J. Reynolds? Uh, it's either, it's one of these towns. It's one of the, it's, uh, I don't know, who cares? Um, uh, Winston Cigarettes, is that a cigarette company? That's where the town of Winston-Salem comes from, Winston. Uh, so our cigarette manufacturers have located here, and that's been a long legacy. Um, next up, cotton. Uh, and so cotton, uh, cotton we also find cotton grown kind of in this coastal plain area. Uh, and so coastal plain, uh, we find a lot of cotton uh, being grown. Now historically there was a whole lot more cotton grown. Uh, but now a lot of cotton grown over there in uh, the San Joaquin Valley, uh, but also a lot of cotton grown in other particular countries. Uh, so the cotton, this used to be where all the cotton was grown, but we can still see that legacy today. Uh, so as we go through the agriculture, then we're going to be able to peel back and understand a little bit more as far as the African-American component here. Uh, anyway, uh, also peanuts. I don't know, this isn't really interesting. Uh, maybe I thought it was interesting, but peanuts are also in that particular area. But anyway, uh, next up, chickens. So we talked about how chickens and the Tyson and manufactured chickens have been, are big there. Over here in North Carolina, another key area of, of chickens. Uh, so if you're going to have uh, your frozen chicken tonight, it's a good chance it's from either North Carolina or Arkansas. Um, so now we know. Uh, hogs. And so hogs are another thing that we find over here in Carolina. Uh, and so Carolina is quite diverse as far as the things that uh, agriculture that it does there. It's got a diverse uh, array of, of, of um, uh, we've got tobacco, we've got some cotton, uh, we've got some chickens, some hogs. Uh, so we're going to look at some particular patterns as far as new migrants that are moving here to this particular area of the country. Uh, and those individuals are working in the agricultural industry. Oh, dude. Oh, timely. Um, and so, uh, hogs. Uh, so once again, we're kind of building this argument that we're seeing a lot of diverse agriculture here in Carolina. Now what we're seeing is Latino growth. Uh, and so once again, uh, these jobs in the agricultural industry. We don't go to IUPUI to work in the agricultural industry. Most people don't go through high school wanting to work in the agricultural industry. Uh, and so the last thing a lot of people who've lived here want to do is go work in ag. So there's demand for jobs. Who's going to fill that void for the demand of jobs? New migrants. And so the Latino migrants have now had this change as far as staying typically in areas close to Mexico or there in Florida, have now started to migrate further inland to, uh, in this case, into North Carolina. And so we can see, once again, also Bentonville, Arkansas, the, the farms from the, the trick growth, the Tyson growth. And so you can see how the Latino migrants that are moving to the rural areas are working largely in agricultural industries. 
which are going to be able to come back to and tie in even further when we look at Mex America and the San Joaquin Valley. And so this is a key theme, Latino growth in much of the Sun Belt, much of the whole southern United States from sea to shining sea is due to agricultural growth and agricultural availability of jobs. Uh, so there are jobs available, it's just um, and scoop and manure. Uh, lower, uh, lowland south. Um, yeah, wow, let's do it. Uh, lowland south. Uh, so the lowland south. Uh, now moving on to the Gulf part of the lowland south. And so previously we were at uh, the, uh, the, uh, over there on the Atlantic side, now we're going to look at the Gulf side. And so once again, those barrier islands, yeah, I did talk about over there on that one side uh, when I talked about the southeast Piedmont and coastal plain, but they're also available, they're also found over here as well. Further, you also have those drowned rivers and estuaries over here as well. Uh, so you're going to see physically a lot of similarities between the other coastal plain and the Atlantic side. Same ideas, rivers going to a coastline, they're creating barrier islands, but also with global sea level rise, we're seeing the formation of these drowned rivers in which cities over time have developed along the fall line uh, further inland. Same idea, just different side. Uh, so there's the Mississippi River Gulf um, area. Now let's talk about the Yazoo Delta. Um, so I don't even know if this will be a question, uh, but I'll go ahead and, and, and ask this question. Uh, is the Yazoo Delta along uh, the Gulf? Wait a minute, it's a delta. Have we learned about deltas? No. The Yazoo Delta. So the Yazoo Delta is actually inland. Uh, so the Yazoo Delta. Uh, is a delta that's not along the ocean. Uh, and so we're going to look at a different delta that is along the ocean. Most people, when they think of deltas, at least I thought most people uh, who knew what a delta was, typically think of them as being right there, which uh, all that water, all the rivers come out onto the ocean, creating a delta, which we've all seen there in, in New Orleans and Louisiana. The Yazoo Delta is further in tier. It's further uh, upland. Uh, and so the, uh, the Yazoo Delta... Where do we find that? So that's going to be the Mississippi River, a little bit further north of New Orleans, up there where we find Memphis and Arkansas. So the Yazoo Delta, much further up. Um, up. And so we'll go to our good friend, uh, the iPad, to find this. That's, but see, I thought most people would think that, okay, that's a delta, and that is a delta. Uh, so this is the delta we're going to look at next. But up here, it's called, this is called the Yazoo Delta. And we can actually see this. See how this, all this area looks different? I think we can see that, right? Yes. Yes, this is the Yazoo Delta. And so this is an area that's quite flat. Uh, it's quite flat because over time, the river has kind of changed its course. It's moved different directions, and it's flat in this area. I've got a video that shows this here uh, in a minute. Uh, but the Yazoo Delta. And so this particular area of, of Mississippi. It's all pretty much right here. Memphis, all throughout this particular area right through here, is the Yazoo Delta. What does that have to do with anything? It has a lot to do with agriculture, but also with African American populations. And so one of the things, we've talked about Germans, we've talked about French, we've talked about English, now we get to talk about African Americans because they're obviously a key component to our history. Uh, and so here we've got the Mississippi River, Memphis, here we see what's being grown, cotton. Uh, so another key area for cotton is also the Yazoo Delta. So in the Yazoo Delta, they also grow cotton, or they grow cotton. What else do they grow, Andy? Um, Oh yeah, I forgot, we get to talk about cotton. Uh, what else do they grow? They grow a lot of soybeans. And so in this particular area, it's quite flat. They grow a lot of soybeans as well. So now it's a very agricultural productive area for not only uh, cotton, uh, but also uh, soybeans. Now, let's use the election. Can we see the Yazoo River Delta uh, here in this map? Uh, yes, we can clearly see that. Wait a minute, we're looking at the percentage black the population is and how they voted in the 2012 election. How can we see the Yazoo River Delta? 
Uh, and so you can see it because of, obviously, the type of migration that occurred here in which African Americans, or sorry, Africans were brought over the Atlantic slave trade to this particular area and over time has settled this area, in this case to grow cotton or, the, or previously soybeans, whatever. Uh, and so over time, this population stayed as, you know, as obviously the plantations changed and the areas changed, but they stayed and made this area stay continuously uh, uh, have a large percentage black population. In 2012, uh, the, who was on the blue team in 2012? Barack Obama. Barack Obama. Who was on the red team? Romney. Mitt Romney. Uh, and so here you have a large population that's percent has a, uh, that's African American. Does it make sense that they vote, vote for the blue team? Yes. Yes, it does. Makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, and so you can see this actually this this uh, historical legacy as far as ag being found here. Further, rice. So in the Yazoo Delta. They grow a very good, they grow a good amount of cotton, rice, soybeans. And so here we can see this area being very agriculturally productive. Uh, so this is an area in which you still see a large rural African American population. All right, now let's go back over here. And this will, this will excite a couple of you. Not all of you. All right. Uh, and so here we have a meandering river. Yeah, we need to get this. All right, so here we have a meandering river. Uh, and so a quick 411 on rivers. When they're straight, that means they're coming down a very steep slope. When they meander, when they go all different directions, it means it's very flat slope. Simple idea, if I poured water on this table, who knows where it would go? If I all of a sudden put one side of this table up and poured water, we would know it would go straight down, and we could very much predict that. And so whenever you see a meandering river like this, you know it's going to be in a coastal plain area. So meandering rivers, they don't occur in a, in a Piedmont, or they don't really occur in an upland area. You're always going to find a meander there, and it's a dead giveaway that that's a lowland area. Uh, but let's go ahead and see if we can follow this. Uh, and so what this is, is just as the river used to do this, but over time it just went past one time and they just cut it off. And so you have these lakes that are kind of horseshoe shaped all throughout. And uh, you kind of have the legacies of sh these, uh, these, these uh, shapes uh, uh, all throughout here. There's one, uh, you can see them all over the place. Uh, and these are called oxbow legs. For this class, we're not going to worry too much about that. All right, so it's kind of just cruise down the Mississippi River here. We're cruising. Uh, kind of what do you notice about the agricultural area? It's kind of a grid pattern, don't we? A lot of grid pattern there along the river. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Continue on, continue on. And so essentially what's going on here is this river is carrying sediment uh, from the further interior and is carrying it down to uh, the Gulf. Uh, kind of keep on cruising. What do we have here? It looks like Longlot. Longlot. Now who did the Longlots? The French. Ah, a French connection here in southern Louisiana. You can bet your bottom dollar is a French connection. So there's the French legacy. Uh, and so in here in uh, the southern part of Louisiana, uh, we can actually see the French legacy still to this day in the formation of these long lots. And that settlement pattern that we found in Quebec, it makes sense that we're going to find it here because they're both of French origin. Uh, and so when we get to the southern tip of, uh, of Louisiana, we can actually see the French influence in many different things. Of course, Mardi Gras uh, is a good example, a uh, high percentage of inflation in this area. Uh, you also have um, uh, a large French speaking, uh, a large, uh, you know, definitely cuisine. Uh, and so that's what the French are known for is cuisine, and so obviously New Orleans has uh, their unique cuisine uh, there. And so here we can kind of begin to see the French legacy. And so as we went down the Mississippi River, you can see how it went from that gridded pattern around that to then the French influence long lot system here along the meanders as we get further closer down to the, uh, to the delta. So here's how that whole uh, area became super flat. Uh, so the river over time, this time lapse over time, changes its course and it flattens out this area. Ag, ag, as we learned beforehand, ag, lights, ag, I'm sorry, ag likes flat areas. 
Uh, so there's no wonder why this area has all this agricultural activity because of being quite flat. So the Yazoo River Delta uh, here is this area all throughout that's been over time, this meandering river that is the Mississippi has then changed and left a lot of sediment there as well, which is also good for the ag of uh, various types. Uh, and so here, a simple way to show why this area looks the way it does. And so, like I said, the French-speaking legacy, we can see that to this day. Uh, this area heavily French. Uh, New Orleans, obviously a French term. Uh, and so we can see that uh, there and also in Catholic population. Uh, so the French, very Catholic, very Roman Catholic. Uh, and so it's that little sliver here that we see in a whole sea of Baptists. And so while the entire south, both upland and lowland, is uh, 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 pro uh, Baptist, uh, down here in our southern tip, we see the, um, the Catholic all right, uh, continue on. Remember the Mississippi River helped to separate. We had all that separation, so we had all that glacier activity, and that glacier had to melt, and so all that melt water came right through here, came gut running through here, and essentially separated the uh, two mountains, uh, separated the Appalachians into two different individual mountains. We learned about these already. Uh, so that Mississippi River then brought all that sediment further to, uh, to the Gulf. Uh, so then I show this because... And this is a real photo that has not been doctored. This has not been Instagrammed, uh, whatever the hell they do with those uh, things. Uh, so this is actually a real photo from NASA, and this is actually after a hurricane had kind of came through here to churn up the waters. Nonetheless, you can see the sediment that is dumped by the Mississippi River and all the various rivers that come off the coastal plain here. Uh, and so you can see the sediment over time uh, that is essentially being spewed out into uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And so beforehand when I was explaining barrier islands, just kind of visualize this, but then of course the counteracting influences that help to create them. Uh, and so that's that it kind of avoid to visualize uh, that sediment there. Uh, so the Mississippi River Delta, uh, we'll go through the Mississippi River Delta real quick. Uh, so there's the Mississippi River Delta. Uh, so if there was, the, if the Mississippi River was not there, the coastline would naturally just go right through here. You can see how it kind of would be this, this fall this natural pattern. The coastline would be right there. What ended up building all of this? Once again, all that sediment, everything that that glacier that just pulverized, washed that out down the slope, down the Mississippi River, and then dumps it here. And so over time, that sediment builds and builds and builds especially with the Mississippi River draining much of the United States, brings with it a lot of sediment. And so the Mississippi River Delta, a very fragile area, uh, an area that with global sea level rise is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, and so here we see, you know, we know about New Orleans, uh, we know about this area, it's a very fragile environment. In fact, I've been to an island out here that no longer exists. And so I was one of the last probably uh, 10 to 20,000 people to be on an island before, poof, it's gone and it'll never be back, uh, right there before Katrina. Uh, anyway, uh, and so there's the Mississippi River Delta that, that essentially brings all that sediment uh, that the Mississippi carries from the interior to uh, the coast. Finally, down here in the, uh, the French part of Louisiana uh, is where we find sugarcane. Uh, so sugarcane is grown in two areas. We're going to come back to and talk about sugarcane when we talk about the islands. Uh, but sugarcane is found down here. Uh, and so essentially, the moral to the story here is the agricultural trends. I've showcased the fact that we still see a large agricultural uh, economy here in the lowland south. It's diverse, uh, but it does have its core key areas, particularly the Yazoo River Delta, where it has that core area, very flat area, but a good amount of, uh, of, of cotton and rice and uh, soybeans found there. All of this helps to explain why we have African Americans here. Uh, so let's go through the history of African American migration in the United States. All right, so, in the, you know, let's see here. Let, I'm actually going to go, I'm going to go deep. This might be too deep, um, but oh well. Uh, here's Charleston. Anybody been to Charleston? Um, I would argue uh, that this, every African American, pretty much every African American in the United States 
can trace their history right to this point right there. Powerful, I think. Uh, so we can almost say this is the homeland of African, African Americans in the United States. Now what does this have to do with anything? What do I mean by that? So if you think about the Atlantic slave trade, the Atlantic slave trade brought large numbers of Africans to the New World, Africans to the Western Hemisphere, Africans to, in this case, the Southeast United States, and that, obviously we know that story. I'm not going to go over that story. And so we have a forced and mass migration, the Atlantic slave trade. And so this was the key harbor and location in which Africans were then essentially bought, sold, and then moved throughout much of the interior for those various agricultural economies that they were going for. Initially, it was cotton along the coast, rice along the coast, uh, but over time, they then penetrated further inland as more and more plantations then grew further deeper away from the coastline. And so pretty much all African Americans to this day can trace their heritage back to this particular spot coming through that particular location right through there, uh, there in Charleston. All right. Back to being shallow. All right. the migration patterns of African Americans in Dixie. So the first pattern, uh, we have that forced and mass migration. Uh, so the forced and mass migration was part of the Atlantic slave trade. And the Atlantic slave trade uh, had this triangle here. You can't see it, uh, but this triangle connects Africa, West Africa, connects the Southeast United States, and it connects England. Essentially this is how it worked. Uh, the trade worked like this. Um, England would send to West Africa manufactured goods, uh, various goods, various things that they would need to help colonize this part of Western Africa. Then, Western Africa, uh, they would then send to America labor in the form of slaves. Now, why was there a demand for labor? At the time, the United States was very lightly populated, but it was a big, old, open, wide open space in which things like tobacco, Things like rice, things like sugar, things like cotton were grown in plentiful amounts. And so you had this plentiful amount of stuff that was grown, very low population. Let's then send that back to England. And so where then slaves were sent to the United States, then from there, the finished goods were sent to England. And so then the tobacco, the rice, and all of that that was harvested here was sent back to England. And so you start to get this triangular trade in which manufacturing goods sent there, slave labor sent this way, and then sending back to England the finished product, the finished good, uh, cigarettes, cigars, whatever uh, it might be. And so that's the Atlantic slave trade. Now, this might be, I'm not, I didn't prepare for this, this might not work, but let's look, at, let's look at sea patterns. Let's look at the way the oceans move. Boy, we're getting really far out now way the oceans move. This is today, right now, wind direction and all of that. Um, so right now there's the East Coast, uh, over here Europe, there's England, uh, there's West Africa. Uh, so this is the predictable pattern, it's pretty much around, the, around year round. Uh, so we have this particular cycle here. You notice this spin. Do you see it? Or am I the only one? <laughs> yes, you see it. And so it makes sense. And so this wind, the year before power boats, the year before shipping, major shipping, you can essentially sail and ride these winds, come to West Africa. Uh, why West Africa? Many reasons. First off, the trade winds. Also in Nigeria in particular, very good at rice uh, cultivation. So they're very, very good at already at these agricultural practices. And so in many ways, they handpicked those particular African groups because when they would come over here, they would very much be the leaders in helping to come up with new techniques and better ways to grow the uh, rice and all of that. And you can see how then, essentially, this triangular trade was facilitated by ocean current patterns. I don't know. Um, maybe that worked, maybe that didn't. Finally, um, wow, we almost got through it. Finally, the Great Migrations. So, uh, we talked about this first migration trend was the forced and mass migration. 
that then obviously explains why we see a large uh, African American population to this day, particularly in rural areas, particularly in areas that are, have this large agricultural legacy. After Civil War, after the 1900s, after early industrialization in the North, we then had a large mass migration. However, however this one wasn't forced. Uh, this one was in which African Americans that were in the South, in, in Dixie, decided to move. And they decided to move somewhere else. Why would they want to move? Go ahead and throw out some reasons why they'd want to move. Maybe some push it. and pull factors. Jobs. Jobs. And so, well, you know, right now at the time in the foundry, jobs are growing through the roof. And so that would be the first thing, would be jobs. Um, further, in the 19, yeah, from World War I to about World War II, we were kind of in eh, with whole immigrants and the whole migration thing for people from other places. Why? We just got done with the World Wars, two World Wars, in fact. And so we were kind of leery about that. And so there were a lot of immigration, immigration restrictions. And so businesses weren't allowed, allowed to hire a large number of immigrants. Uh, and so because of that kind of that, that lack of a supply of jobs and those immigrants that no longer were coming over, there became a demand for jobs, a demand for labor, and that was largely these African Americans that were finding uh, those uh, jobs that were found in the North, but not so much in the South. Other reasons. So other reasons. I'll go throw that up, why not? Uh, and so that's the jobs. That's Detroit, Indy. St. Louis, Chicago, uh, so we can see that. So those are those industry jobs. Why else would they want to move? Uh, because they don't like it there? Yeah, why would you not like it in the South? <laughs> because the because South. I wasn't treated well? Yeah, <laughs> good, 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 yeah. In the South, I don't know if you knew this, but the South, there's a lot of discrimination still to this day, but it's something that's actually improved considerably, although it's still there, uh, consider, you know, we still have that, uh, definitely some racist, uh, we can go on and on and on about the, the South, and it still has those legacies today. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, discrimination uh, would be another thing. Uh, some other things, you know, uh, uh, just kind of throw out there. Um, during World War I and World War II, a lot of Africans, uh, African Americans were drafted. Uh, and so they were drafted or they were participated, participated in our military. And so then they're stationed in other places, uh, other places in the country, other places in the rest of the world. And so when you get to first hand see what it's like to not be segregated, when you get to see what it's like not to have discrimination, you kind of think it's all right. It's kind of a cool thing. And so it's actually kind of those deployments help to kind of, you know, make people aware of other places, more desirable places to live. Um, other things, I think we pretty much hit the big ones. Jobs is the big one by far. Um, better life, not being discriminated against. Uh, better schools, so you know, better schools for your kids. I mean, that's, you know, I didn't realize that until all of a sudden all my friends started having kids. All of a sudden that becomes a big deal where you live. Uh, so better schools, even if it was in a uh, segregated area up in the north, typically the segregated areas had more resources. Uh, the black schools had more resources than uh, the north and the south. Um, I don't know, on and on and on, other reasons as well. Um, anyway, uh, more recently we've had a return migration. <clears throat> so whereas, we have these three migrations. We've had the forced and mass migration that brought Africans to the United States. We then had the Great Migration, a mass out migration to the north. More recently, you've had a return migration to Atlanta, to Charlotte. And so a lot of those grandkids of those people that migrated to work in Detroit, work in Cleveland, have since migrated back to the south. But they're not going back to the Yazoo Delta. They're not going back to rural Alabama. They're going to the cities. They're going to Atlanta, Charlotte, Jackson, no, not so much Jacksonville. Uh, the, ignore that one. Uh, yeah, during Jacksonville, someone sneezed, so you didn't hear that one. Uh, also, uh, Birmingham, Alabama, New Orleans, uh, the places that we can think of the dirty south in which they've got the famous hip hop art, you got the whole Atlanta scene that's grown. Uh, and so music is a good way to follow this migration uh, as well, which we do in 110, G110. Uh, so more recently, a return migration, and that migration has been fueled by, once again, jobs. Uh, so now that the foundry, now that New England has had this uh, lack of jobs, now there's jobs available in the South, ah, go ahead and come on back. Further, if you've got relatives, kinship, you've got cousins and uh, various fa extended family members that live there, it makes it more uh, likely that you're also going to move back as well. Uh, so these various reasons you're seeing a return migration. Why would any of us like to move to the South? 
Weather. Weather, climate. Same reasons why we would want to move. Anybody would want to move. Uh, and so you're seeing a return migration of African Americans uh, right now. And it's been something that's happened since about the 70s or 80s. Uh, so it's been more recently uh, we've seen the return migration. All right, almost done. Uh, moving right along, where are we at? Now another question. Uh, so this question was the one I was hinting at earlier for the two that were listening. Describe three key reasons the lowland south urbanized after the 1950s. Uh, so why did the urbanization of the south not occur until the 1950s? While, while you know, the, the, the boundary heavily urbanized, the Midwest urbanized, the breadbasket started to urbanize. Even in California and the west coast you started to see urbanization. Why did the south remain very much this rural area that more recently has seen city growth, more recently seen urbanization. Why? Let's go through some key reasons. Um, oh, well, this is one way to showcase that, but we'll move on. Uh, the first reason. Uh, the first reason is simple. We've already talked about it. That agricultural history. And so it makes sense that an area that's heavily agricultural is then subsequently going to be more rural. Further, because an area is heavily agricultural, if that's the number one you know, key driver to the economy, that's the number one job provider, the people that lead the government officials, they don't want to change that. They don't want to change the, you know, they want to keep that the case. And so you had leadership over time that was really not wanting to change and develop industry, develop new technologies. They pretty much put all their eggs in the agricultural basket. So the legacy of agricultural uh, productivity of Dixie in the Lowland South explains why, first off, they were late and they historically would not have had the industrial growth that we saw there in the foundry there around the 1900s. Uh, so it's a little bit later on. Further, um, uh, this was invented in the 1930s but wasn't mass produced until the 1950s. What is it? Air conditioning. Air conditioning. Uh, so this sounds stupid. Uh, but the air conditioner helped to open up this lowland south as well. If you've been to the lowland south, it's hot, muggy, miserable summers. Oh, it's miserable eight years of, uh, or sorry, eight months of the year. Uh, and so the invention of the air conditioner made the south a little bit more hospitable, especially in residences, but also in offices uh, and commercial buildings as well. And so the invention of the air conditioner also helped uh, to then draw people to the south. And as you have move, people moving to the south, they're preferring to move into uh, the urban areas. And so this is another key thing, uh, the, the role of uh, the air conditioner. All right, so you can't see all this, but the third thing was African-American migration patterns. And so I talked about how African-Americans migrated out of, the, out of the lowland south, out of the south. That's true, but even during that time of out-migration, the population doubled. Uh, and so the population of African Americans in the South doubled. What's going on there? Very high birth rates historically. Historically high birth rates, high total fertility rates. What that means is on average women have more children, uh, uh, African American women have on average more children uh, than other groups. Uh, and so that's key to driving this uh, is the high birth rate. But at the same time, the African American population was growing. At the same time, they were heavily urbanizing. Uh, so 63% of African Americans were rural in 1940, by 1990, 31%. So essentially the moral of the story is African American population in the South grew, and as it grew, it also moved to the cities. Uh, so it moved to urban areas. Another key reason why urbanization didn't really take off until after the 1950s. In fact, in, fact, in the South, uh, blacks had a, were a larger percentage of the rural population than whites. Uh, which is uh, you know, now today is, uh, other than the South, we don't see that anywhere close, pretty much anywhere else in the country. Um, other things with this, so I think this is our fourth reason, or third reason maybe, uh, and that's the, the rise of the New South. Uh, and so the New South, the New South is more of an economic term uh, to describe the characteristics of this particular area. Uh, so this particular area, the New South, what is it? Uh, what caused the New South? The Old South is that plantation-based, old relic of that kind of that uh, early agricultural-focused um, economy. 
uh, today, that primary sector, agriculture is a primary sector industry, uh, it's, not, it's no longer overwhelmingly the only economic uh, driver. Uh, so they diversify their portfolio, to use a finance term. Uh, so less of a reliance on the primary sector. Further, while the, uh, the foundry, while Anderson, Indiana, while Detroit has lost industrial jobs, industrial jobs have actually kind of stabilized here. Uh, and so what's happening is the secondary sector, manufacturing, is stable. Uh, and so it's seen a large growth of, of manufacturing of cars, uh, of manufacturing of high-tech things, CAT scan machines, but less textiles, less simple things. Uh, and so the secondary sector, it's kind of changed. Uh, it's changed from simple things to more complex things, uh, but at the same time, it's stable. Uh, so where losses of, of one particular area, textiles, for example, have been offset by gains in sophisticated electronics. FDI is foreign direct investment, and so what's happening is foreign companies are now choosing to build and locate their facilities in the South. Historically, they would never have done that. For two key reasons, they would never have done that. First off, this, the workers weren't skilled enough. Uh, so there would be a, first off, the, there would be a fear. And so one of the things that's also happening is the skill level, the education levels of the South has risen uh, somewhat. Uh, another thing is, they actually at first, they didn't like unions. Sorry, they, they're, sorry, foreign direct investors, they do like unions uh, at first. Uh, because if you're investing in a new company, you want to make sure that you know the workers that you're going to be going into a contract with are going to show up on time, are going to do the job. And so by connecting with unions, that was seen as something that previously uh, was something that seemed as attractive, but here in the South, uh, no unions is more attractive today. Uh, anyway, uh, tertiary and quaternary sector, those are high school jobs. Uh, and so we're seeing high school job growth there. And so high school jobs is going to attract high school people. And so the New South has changed. No longer agricultural base. No longer is it simple textiles and simple manufacturing. It's now sophisticated, tech, uh, sophisticated manufacturing, uh, but also sophisticated high school jobs uh, and so forth. Finally, edge cities. Uh, so now what's happening is you're seeing these cities and these places pop up around Atlanta and around Charlotte. Uh, so we'll go to our iPad. Uh, what are edge cities? Edge cities are these little, uh, uh, little downtowns that are scattered throughout an urban area. And these little downtowns, they have to have just as many or more jobs than they do uh, residents. Uh, so to be an edge city, you have to have a greater number of jobs than workers in a particular area. Uh, so when you do that, when you have more jobs versus residents, uh, that means you have an edge city. Uh, so these edge cities are also key to understanding urbanization uh, since the 1950s. If we go to Atlanta, we can really see this. Uh, so if you've been to Atlanta, you know this. Is there an example of an edge city in somewhere in the Midwest? Uh, the only, we, uh, Indiana, the state of Indiana only has one edge city. Carmel. Carmel, Indiana is an edge city. Uh, so Carmel, Carmel, Indiana is actually, if you notice, they're, um, they're becoming such an edge city that they're creating a downtown that doesn't exist. Uh, so they're growing so quickly, uh, they're growing so fast, there's so much job growth that's happening there uh, that they're actually having to create kind of a downtown and main street because they really didn't ever had one. Uh, so that's one of the things. And so uh, uh, Schaumburg, uh, Illinois would be an edge city. Oh, there's tons of them. Um, Chicago's got probably 20 of them. Uh, all that out by O'Hare. I think that's all Schaumburg. We'll just take you to this one here. When you said the downtown for Carmel, is that the arts and district place? Yeah, it's a combination of the really? place where the kind of that Bub's Burger area there, where it's got the, the, the people, that the statues of the, like the guy on the bike or whatever. It's really creepy. Yeah, the policeman. <laughs> but also that area just the south of that, um, where you've got the uh, Parthenon or Antonium. The really ugly building. It's actually not bad looking compared to how we normally how we build building. This is the ugliest building in the world right here. Uh, all right, let's go to Hot Atlanta. All right, here's Hot Atlanta. Uh, so here is downtown uh, Atlanta. Boom. So there's downtown Atlanta. Uh, there's the sporting facilities. Here's uh, I-65 comes right through here. Skirts right through this particular area right there. And while I'm here, 
I'm going to then briefly talk about the racist policies uh, that are common in the South. And so, this interstate had to be chosen. Where are you going to put this interstate? It could go on one side of the city or it could go on the other side of the city. And so what happened is they chose this side of the city. Now, why did they choose this side of the city? A large African-American population, if you don't believe me. Where is he? There he is. There's Martin Luther King Jr. That's where he's buried. Uh, that's the house he grew up in, right down there. Uh, that's the church he went to. Uh, that's now the church that he's at now. And so all of this is a thriving African-American community. And so essentially build the interstate here. And what you do is you disconnect the downtown, the touristy area, from what is perceived to be a less desirable area. And so you can see the racist policies uh, of the South. And this is very common. We still see this to this day uh, all throughout the South. But anyway, uh, so there's downtown. Now I go further up. And I got another little cluster here. This is Midtown. So another little cluster. I go across the street, across the interstate. Another cluster, another edge city. Let's go further up the interstate. Now, Edge City, I mean, you can definitely see them clearly here because of the skyscraper characteristics. Continue up. 65 here, or whatever this is. And we get to Buckhead. I didn't cuss. Where's Buckhead? It's, up, it's to the left. Did you see it? Yeah. There it is. Buckhead. Here? Yeah, Buckhead. Boom. Another, another urban little cluster. And you can see, I mean, these skyscrapers, this is like a little edge city in an area of residential. And so throughout much of Atlanta, you've got these edge cities that are pop up, they're all throughout. Uh, they're typically on interstates, key interstate uh, transitions. Uh, but Atlanta is also really invested in this right here. Uh, and so global transportation, transportation uh, as far as especially air transportation. Uh, and so that makes sense. Atlanta, not on a coastline, not on a major river, uh, was kind of late to the whole railroad game. Uh, and so where is it, where is it, why is it thriving? It's key location on the interstate. Uh, and so post 1950s, but today uh, it's, it's definitely a focal node for our uh, uh, air transport. Uh, so this is, I believe, Delta's headquarters is here. Uh, so I guarantee you, if you've flown over 10 times in your life, you've gone through Atlanta uh, sometime. And finally, a segregated city. Uh, so here you can see all the black population here. Uh, very segregated city. Uh, all the southern cities are like this. Really, any cities like this. Uh, anymore, but uh, very like this, very much like this, and so this is that uh, Martin Luther King area uh, over here. Uh, anyway, 